Hi there, this is Lila, An Inquiry into Morals by Robert M. Piercig, and I'm going to be reading the entirety of chapter two. When Phaedrus awoke, he saw through the hatch that the sky had become less black. Dawn was coming. Then he realized he wasn't alone. In fact, he was blocked physically from getting out of the bunk by a body between him and the boat's passageway. This was Lila, he remembered. He saw that, with some careful maneuvering, he could slink up through the open hatch and come around on deck and re-enter the cabin from the cockpit. He lifted himself up carefully, and then he got through the hatch without disturbing her. Nice work. The cold deck on his bare feet really woke him up. He couldn't feel any ice, but the fiberglass coach roof was the next thing to it. It helped to shake off all the alcohol fumes in his head. Nothing like walking around bare naked on top of a freezing boat to wake you up for the day. Everything was so quiet now. The dawn was still so early. The turn of the creek in the distance was barely visible. Hard to believe what Regal said, that around that turn, a cold barge could go all the way to the ocean. He went over and checked the lines going over to Regal's boat. They were a little loose, and he took up on one of the spring lines and then tightened all of them. He should have done that before he went to bed. He'd been too drunk to take care of details like that. He looked around, and despite the cold, a dawn mystery took a hold of him. Some of the other boats had come in since he had and were rafted ahead and behind him. Possibly one of them was the boat Lila had come on. The harbor looked scuzzy and old in places, but it showed some signs of gentrification in others. Pseudo-Victorian, it looked like, but not bad. Off in the distance was a crane and other masts. The Hudson River was completely out of sight. It felt good not to be related to this harbor in any way. He didn't know what was above the banks of the river or behind the harbor buildings or where the roads led to or who the houses belonged to or what people would appear here today or what people they would meet. It was like a picture book, and he was a child, watching it, waiting for a page to be turned. Shivering broke the spell. His skin was covered with goosebumps. He went back to the stern of the boat, hung off the boom gallows with one arm, and relieved into the creek. Then he stepped down to the cockpit, pushed the heavy teak hatch cover back, and let himself down with a grace that had come from a familiar motion. It was a grace he'd acquired the hard way. When he first got the boat, he walked around like it was a house, slipped on some diesel oil, plunged headfirst into the companionway ladder, and broke a collarbone. Now he'd learned to move like a spider monkey, particularly in storms when the whole boat rose and pitched and rolled like a flying trapeze. In the cabin, he felt his way to an overhead light and flicked it on. The darkness was filled instantly with familiar teak and mahogany. He went forward into the deck fore cabin and found his clothes in the bunk opposite Lila. She had evidently rolled over since he left. Her shadowy shape looked about the same from this side as it had from the other a few minutes ago. He closed the fore cabin door and went into the main cabin where he pulled open a wood bin cover, took out his old heavy brown sweater and drew it over his head. When he pushed the cover shut, the snap of its catch disturbed the silence. He went back to the companionway ladder put the hatch's drop boards in place, and slid the heavy hatch cover shut. This place needed some heat. Next to the ladder, by the chart table, he found matches and alcohol. He carefully brought a little cupful of the alcohol to a small coal stove mounted on the bulkhead at the other end of the cabin and poured the alcohol over some charcoal briquettes inside. On the picture book shore out there, everything was done by magic. They got their heat and electricity without even thinking about it. But in this little floating world, whatever you needed, you had to get for yourself. He lit a match, tossed it in, and watched the alcohol go poof and fill the stove with a pale blue-purple flame. He was glad he'd loaded the stove yesterday. He wouldn't want to have to do it now. Was that just yesterday? It seemed like a week. He closed the stove door, watched it for a moment, until out of the corner of his eye he saw an enormous suitcase he had never seen before. Where did that come from, he wondered. It wasn't his. Lila must have brought it with her. He thought about it as he struck another match at a gimbaled brass kerosene lamp. He adjusted the wick until the flame seemed right. Then he turned off the overhead electric light and sat down on the berth under the lamp, his back against a rolled sleeping bag. As far as he could figure, 
He must have made some sort of deal with her to come on the boat, or she wouldn't have brought the suitcase. Now the kerosene light glowed over all the wood and bronze and brass and fabric shapes of the cabin, and another invisible glow of warmth came from the black coal stove that now made cricking heating noises. Soon it would heat everything up enough to make it all comfortable, except for that suitcase. What was coming back to mind wasn't making him comfortable at all. He remembered she dropped the suitcase on Regal's deck, really hard. When they walked across to come aboard, he turned and told her to keep it quiet. He remembered she shouted, Don't tell me to keep it quiet, in a voice you could hear all over the harbor. It was all coming back, going over to her boat, waiting for her to pack, listening to her talk about that dirty double-crosser George and his whore, Debbie. Uh-oh. He guessed it couldn't be so bad, though, just a couple of days into Manhattan and then she would be gone. No harm done. He saw that her suitcase had shoved all his trays of slips over to one side of the pilot berth. They were for a book he was working on, and one of the four long card catalog type trays was by an edge where it could fall off. That's all he needed, he thought. About 3,000 four by six slips of notepad paper all over the floor. He got up and adjusted the sliding rest inside each tray so that it was tight against the slips and they couldn't fall out. Then he carefully pushed the trays back into a safer place in the rear of the berth. Then he went back and sat down again. It would actually be easier to lose the boat than it would be to lose those slips. There were about 11,000 of them. They'd grown out of almost four years of organizing and reorganizing and reorganizing so many times he'd become dizzy trying to fit them all together. He'd just about given up. The overall subject, he called a metaphysics of quality, or sometimes a metaphysics of value, or sometimes just MOQ to save time. The buildings out there on the shore were in one world, and these slips were in another. This slip world was quite a world, and he'd almost lost it once because he hadn't written any of it down, and incidents came along that had destroyed his memory of it. Now he had reconstructed what seemed like most of it on these slips, and he didn't want to lose it again. But maybe it was a good thing he had lost it, because now in the reconstruction of it, all sorts of new material was flooding in. So much that his main task was to get it processed before it log jammed in his head, into some kind of a block that he couldn't get out of. Now the main purpose of the slips was not to help him remember anything, it was to help him forget it. That sounded contradictory, but the purpose was to keep his head empty, to put all his ideas of the past four years on that pilot berth, where he didn't have to think of them. That was what he wanted. There's an old analogy of a cup of tea. If you want to drink new tea, you have to get rid of the old tea that's in your cup. Otherwise, your cup just overflows, and you get a wet mess. Your head is like that cup. It has a limited capacity, and if you want to learn something about the world, you should keep your head empty in order to learn it. It's very easy to spend your whole life swishing old tea around in your cup thinking it's great stuff because you've never really tried anything new, because you could never get it in, because the old stuff prevented its entry, because you were so sure the old stuff was so good, because you never really tried anything new, on and on in an endless circular pattern. The reason feeders use slips rather than full-size sheets of paper is that a card catalog tray full of slips provides more random access. When information is organized in small chunks that it can be accessed and sequenced at random, it becomes much more valuable than when you have to take it in serial form. It's better, for example, to run a post office where the patrons have numbered boxes and can come in and access these boxes at any time they please. It's worse to have them all come in at a certain time, stand in a queue, and get their mail from Joe, who has to sort through everything alphabetically each time, and who has rheumatism and is going to retire in a few years and who doesn't care whether they liked waiting or not. When any distribution is locked into a rigid sequential format, it develops Joes that dictate what new changes will be allowed and what will not. And that rigidity is deadly. Some of the slips were actually about this topic, random access and quality. The two are closely related. Random access is at the essence of organic growth, in which cells, like post office boxes, are relatively independent. Cities are based on random access. Democracies are founded on it. The free market system, free speech, and the growth of science are all based on it. A library is one of civilization's most powerful tools precisely because of its card catalog trays. Without the Dewey Decimal System allowing the number of cards in the main catalog to grow or shrink at any point, the whole library would soon grow stale and useless and die.
And so while those trays certainly didn't have much glamour, they nevertheless had the hidden strength of a card catalog. They ensured that by keeping his head empty and keeping sequential formatting to a minimum, no fresh or unexplored idea would be forgotten or shut out. There were no ideological Joes to kill an idea because it didn't fit into what he was already thinking. Because he didn't prejudge the fittingness of new ideas or try to put them in order, but just let them flow in, these ideas sometimes came in so fast he couldn't write them down quickly enough. The subject matter, a whole metaphysics, was so enormous, the flow had turned into an avalanche. The slips kept expanding in every direction, so that the more he saw, the more he saw there was to see. It was like a Venturi effect, which pulled ideas into it endlessly, on and on. He saw there were a million things to read, a million leads to follow. Too much. Too much. And not enough time in one life to get it all together. Snowed under. There'd been times when an urge surfaced to take the slips, pile by pile, and file them into the door of the coal stove on top of the glowing charcoal briquettes, and then close the door and listen to the cricking of the metal as they turned into smoke. Then it would all be gone and he would really be free again, except he wouldn't be free. It would still be there in his mind to do. So he spent most of his time submerged in chaos, knowing that the longer he put off setting into a fixed organization, the more difficult it would become. But he felt sure that sooner or later, some sort of format would have to emerge and it would be a better one for his having waited. Eventually, this belief was justified. Periods started to appear when he just sat there for hours and no slips came in. And this, he saw, was at last the time for organizing. He was pleased to discover that the slips themselves made the organizing much easier. Instead of asking, where does this metaphysics of the universe begin, which was a virtually impossible question, all he had to do was just hold up two slips and ask, which comes first? This was easy, and he always seemed to get an answer. Then he would take a third slip, compare it with the first one, and ask again, which comes first? If the new slip came after the first one, he compared it with the second. Then he had a three-slip organization. He kept repeating the process with slip after slip. Before long, he noticed certain categories emerging. The earlier slips began to merge about a common topic, and later slips about a different topic. When enough slips merged about a single topic so that he got a feeling it would be permanent, he took an index card of the same size as the slips, attached a transparent plastic index tab to it, wrote the name of the topic on a little cardboard insert that came with the tab, put it in the tab, and put the index card together with its related topic slips. The trays on the pilot berth now had about four or five hundred of these tabbed index cards. At various times, he tried all kinds of different things, colored plastic tabs to indicate subtopics and sub-subtopics, stars to indicate relative importance, slips split with a line to indicate both emotive and rational aspects of their subject. But all of these had increased rather than decreased confusion, and he found it clearer to include their information elsewhere. It was fascinating to watch this thing grow. No one he knew had ever written a whole metaphysics before, and there were no rules for doing it and no way of predicting how it would progress. In addition to the topic categories, five other categories had emerged. Peters felt these were of great importance. The first was unassimilated. This contained new ideas that interrupted what he was doing. They came in on the spur of the moment while he was organizing the other slips or sailing or working on the boat or doing something else that didn't want to be disturbed. Normally, your mind says to these ideas, go away, I'm busy, but that attitude is deadly to quality. The unassimilated pile helped solve the problem. He just stuck the slips there on hold until he had the time and desire to get to them. The next non-topical category was called program. Program slips were instructions for what to do with the rest of the slips. They kept track of the forest while he was busy thinking about individual trees. With more than 10,000 trees that kept wanting to expand to 100,000, the program slips were absolutely necessary to keep from getting lost. What made them so powerful was that they too were on slips, one slip for each instruction. This means the program slips were random access too and could be changed and resequenced as need arose without any difficulty. He remember reading that John von Neumann, the inventor of the computer, 
had said the single thing that makes the computer so powerful is that the program is data and can be treated like any other data. That seemed a little obscure when Fedris had read it, but now it was making sense. The next slips were crit slips. These were for days when he woke up in a foul mood and could find nothing but fault everywhere. He knew from experience that if he threw stuff away on these days, he would regret it later, so instead he satisfied his anger by just describing all the stuff he wanted to destroy and the reasons for destroying it. The crit slips would then wait for days or sometimes months for a calmer period when he could make a more dispassionate judgment. The next to the last group was the tough category. This contained slips that seemed to say something of importance but didn't fit into any topic he could think of. It prevented getting stuck on some slip whose place might be obvious later on. The final category was junk. These were slips that seemed of high value when he wrote them down, but now seemed awful. Sometimes it included duplicates of slips he'd forgotten he'd written. These duplicates were thrown away, but nothing else was discarded. He'd found over and over again that the junk pile is a working category. Most slips died there, but some reincarnated, and some of these reincarnated slips were the most important ones he had. Actually, these last two piles, junk and tough, were the piles that gave him the most concern. The whole thrust of the organizing effort was to have as few of these as possible. When they appeared, he had to fight the tendency to slight them, shove them under the carpet, throw them out the window, belittle them, and forget them. These were the underdogs, the outsiders, the pariahs, the sinners of the system. But the reason he was so concerned about them was that he felt the quality and strength of his entire system of organization depended on how he treated them. If he treated the pariahs well, he would have a good system. If he treated them badly, he would have a weak one. They could not be allowed to destroy all efforts at organization, but he couldn't allow himself to forget them either. They just stood there, accusing, and he had to listen. The hundreds of topics had organized themselves into larger sections, the sections into chapters, and the chapters into parts, so that what the slips had organized themselves into finally was the contents of a book. But it was a book whose organization was from the bottom up rather than the top down. He hadn't started with a master idea and then selected in Joe fashion only those slips that would fit. In this case, Joe, the organizing principal, had been democratically elected by the slips themselves. The junk and tough slips didn't participate in this election, and that created an underlying dissatisfaction. But he felt that you can't expect a perfect system of organization of anything. He'd kept the junk pile as small as possible without deliberately suppressing it, and that was the most anyone could ask. A description of this system makes it all sound a lot easier than it actually was. Often he got into a situation where incoming tough strips and the junk slips would indicate his whole system of making topics was wrong. Some slips would fit into two or three categories, and other slips would fit into no categories at all, and he began to see that he would have to tear the whole system of organization apart and begin to reorganize it differently because if he didn't, the junk pile and the tough pile and the crit pile would start howling at him louder and louder until he had to do it. Those were bad days, but sometimes the new reorganization would leave the junk piles and the tough piles bigger than they were when he started. Slips that had fit the old organization now didn't fit the new one, and he began to see that what he had to do now was go back and redo it all over again the old way. Those were the really bad days. Sometimes he would make a program procedure that would allow him to go back where he started, but in the process of making it, he saw that the program procedure needed modification, so he started to modify that, but in the process of modification, he saw that the modification needed modification, so he started to modify that, but then he saw that even that was no good, and then, just about at this time, the phone would ring, and it would be someone wanting to sell him something or congratulate him on the previous book he had written or invite him to some conference or get him to lecture somewhere. They were usually well-intentioned callers, but when he was done with them, he would just sit there, blocked. He began to think that if he just got away from people on this boat and had enough time, it would come to him. But it hadn't worked out as well as he'd hoped. You just get other kinds of interruptions. A storm comes up and you worry about the anchor or another yacht pulls up and they come over and want to socialize or there's a drunken party down the dock, on and on. He got up, went over to the pilot berth, got some more charcoal briquettes and put them on the coal stove. 
It was getting nice and warm now. He picked up one of the trays and looked at it. The front of it showed rust through the paint. You couldn't keep anything of steel from rusting on a boat, even stainless, and these boxes were ordinary mild steel sheet metal. He would have to make some new ones out of marine plywood and glue when he had the time, maybe when he got south. This tray was the oldest one. It had slips he hadn't looked at for more than a year now. He brought it over to the table with him. The first topic at the very front of the tray was Duesenberry. He looked at it nostalgically. At one time he thought Duesenberry was going to be at the center of the whole book. After a while, he took a blank pad from the back of the tray and wrote on the top slip, program, and then under it, hang up everything until Lila gone. Then he tore the slip off the notepad and put the slip in front of the program pile and put the notepad in the back of the tray. It was important, he found, to write a program slip for what you were currently doing. It seems unnecessary at the time you were writing it, but later, when interruptions have interrupted interruptions, which have interrupted interruptions, you'll be glad you did it. The crit slips had been saying for months that Duesenberry had to go, but he never seemed to be able to get rid of it. It just stayed there for what seemed to be sentimental reasons. Now it had been shoved into lesser and lesser importance by incoming slips, and was just hanging on, teetering on the edge of the junk pile. He took the whole Duesenberry topic section out. The slips were getting brown around the edges, and the ink was turning brown too, on the very first slip. It said, Vern Duesenberry, Associate Professor, English Department, Montana State College, died, brain tumor, 1966, Calgary, Alberta. He made the slip, probably, so he'd remember the year.